Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for including me here. And this morning we're going to be looking at this radical revolution in terms of Christ's global inclusion, uh, his universal embrace, his, his cosmic reconciliation. And I think that a great way to do that would be to set the stage with one of Isaiah's visions, where he saw the river of life flowing from the temple to all nations, along with the invitation of the Spirit and the Bride in the book of Revelation, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? I see water. Vidi aquam. Eric, would you share with us what that looks like? thirsty. The spirit and the bride say, come, come to the waters. Let the kings bring the glory of the nations into the temple and drink of those waters. All are welcome and her gates will never be shut. And this is the vision that Isaiah had of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The fountain 
of living water, the river of life that pours forth into the nations and welcomes everyone. Let's go to the first slide. We have this incredible announcement. You're in. You are in. Which then raises a question for the insiders. They are in too? Them? Are you sure? Because you see, there were competing visions of righteousness. And last week, if you were here or listened online, you would have heard Brian Zahn, my dear friend and favorite preacher, telling us about these competing visions of righteousness where on the one hand, you've got the backstory of uh, Balaam telling King Balak, include some Moabite women into the camp and let them seduce our men and bring the whole thing down. And it's this incredible disaster. And then Phineas comes to the rescue with a murder. It turns into a minor genocide. And this becomes reckoned unto him as righteousness. That violent zeal was a vision of righteousness to solve the problem of inclusion. And this week, we want to explore how that competing vision then also becomes codified in the law. You know, in... Uh, if you don't want to have to have a Phineas incident over and over and over again, you instill it in the law. And one of the ways you do that is you mark out who is excluded. And there's all sorts of exclusion in the Deuteronomic law that says, if you want it to go well with you, here is who's out. Law after law after law. One of the intriguing ones to me is Deuteronomy 23, where he says, now listen here, here's who's out and can't come in. First of all, if you've been emasculated through crushing or cutting, Lord have mercy. One translation tells you what the body parts are. If you become a eunuch or in some way castrated, you are excluded. Also, if you are born of a forbidden marriage, and so some translations will say, well, you know, that's the child of a prostitute, or maybe it's the child of those who, are, who, who were not married at all, but actually it's a forbidden marriage, intermarriage, you're out. Not only are you out, your kids are out, and your grandkids are out, and your great-grandkids are out, and your great-great, to ten generations. If you are the fruit of a forbidden marriage, you're out, and you can't come in ever. And also, if you happen to be an Ammonite or a Moabite, you're out too. There's no place for you here because you didn't, well, your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents didn't welcome the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt with bread and water. And these exclusions multiply and become codified. And we'll go to the next slide. And so what we've got here is these conflicting visions of righteousness. You've got the law on the one hand and Isaiah's vision on the other hand. And so it's not just violent zeal, but the violent zeal becomes codified as exclusion, expulsion, and when necessary, eradication, whether it's outsiders bringing their sin in or insiders having their sin float up, the solution is exclusion. And yet you've got this other vision that comes about through the prophets, the ones who see a better world, the ones, ones who see that there is a righteousness of radical engagement and inclusion that looks like the river flowing from the temple. Flowing from the temple. What a contrast. So at some point then, how do the people of God make that corner? How do they turn the corner from zealous exclusionists into radical inclusionists? And this brings us to the story of Cornelius in 
the book of Acts, where the apostle Peter, as one of these zealous exclusionists, has a wake-up call. And it's so important to the history of the people of God that it not only tells us the story, but then we have the book of Acts repeating the story through Peter's eyes. Peter, the one who was an eyewitness of the risen Christ. Peter, the one who had heard the Great Commission to go to all nations. Peter, the one who still would not eat with Gentiles. How is he going to make that corner? Well, he tells us in Acts chapter 11. When he went up to Jerusalem, some of the circumcised disputed with him, saying, you went indoors with men who have foreskins. How does it keep coming back to that? And he, not only that, you ate with them. And Peter explained it to them from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in an ecstasy I saw a vision. A certain shape descending like a great sheet, having been let down from the sky by four corners. And it came right up to me, gazing into which I perceived and saw the quadrupeds of the earth, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the birds of the sky. And I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, sacrifice and eat. And I said, certainly not, Lord, for nothing profane or impure has ever entered my mouth. And a voice answered a second time, out of the sky... Do not deem profane what God has made pure. And this happened three times, and everything was lifted into the sky again. He denied Christ three times. Deja vu. And see, all at once three men were standing at the household where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, hesitating at nothing. And these six brethren came with me as well, and we went into the men's house, and he recounted to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and son, summon Simon, who is also called Peter, who will speak words to you by which you may be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Spirit, the Holy One, fell upon them as upon us also at the beginning." And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, if God gave them a gift equal to the one he also gave us, when we had faith in the Lord Jesus the anointed, who was I that I might hinder God? And hearing these things, they quieted down and gave glory to God, saying, Then God has also given the nations a turning of the heart toward life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we have here Cornelius before Christ. And we'll go to the next slide. And there are some really amazing affirmations of this pre-Christian man. First of all, we have an affirmation by God through the Apostle Peter of Cornelius' pre-Christian faith practices. First of all, the text in chapter 10 says he was devout. That means deeply committed, faithful, he was a devout man, and he revered God, and not just any God, not the God of his own imagination. He wasn't his own pope or something like this. He feared the God or honored the God, revered the God, and worshipped the God of Abraham. And we know this because the Jews were mightily impressed of him. The Jewish people in his community had seen him, and they had identified him as a God-fearer, someone who believed in and worshipped the God of Abraham. Not only that, but we read that he donated generously. He was an alms giver. And in that context, do you remember when Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven? How do you do that? In the Jewish world and even in the Sermon on the Mount, that is done through almsgiving. And this man was an almsgiver. And not only was he one who donated alms generously to the poor, 
But the text says that God saw it and remembered. God noticed his almsgiving. He noticed his treatment to the poor. Not only that, but we read that he was continually praying. And not only continually praying, but that God heard those prayers, which is quite amazing. So here we have a man who's not a Christian yet, and yet God notices his treatment of the poor as an act of righteousness. And he hears his prayers from heaven. And when he begins to communicate with Cornelius, we also find out that at every single stage prior to his conversion, he is zealous to obey God, to hear God's voice and does what he says. Oh, that, that's the man who builds his house on the rock. He not only has these faith practices, but he also has a series of authentic spiritual experiences. And let's go to the, slide, the next slide. And so included in these, in these faith experiences, this is not bad for a guy who's not a Christian yet. He's having visions, and some of you have had visions, profound visions, and he's having visions after the same kind of tone and content of Daniel in the Old Testament or John in the book of Revelation. Here's a man having visions of God prior to his conversion to Jesus Christ, prior to his revelation of the gospel. Not just visions, but angelic visitations such that you would read in Revelation chapter 1 or Daniel chapter 9. An angel, angel comes to him and he has an interaction with an angel of the living God. And this angel of the living God begins to deliver him words from the Lord, messages from God. So can you hear God before you come to Christ? Cornelius did. And in fact, he was getting words of knowledge that included specific addresses and names. That's not bad. I don't get those. I give it a go sometimes, and I sometimes find myself on the wrong street corner, talking to the wrong person. But, you know, uh, not, so, not so with Cornelius. He, he, would get a, he got words of knowledge about, here's the man you're going to meet, and his name is Simon. And you're going to meet him at this other man's house, Simon, the he even knows what Simon's job is. He's a tanner, you know. So we've got this kind of, we've got this kind of revelation going on. Not only that, but he is. There are third-party revelations about him being delivered to the preeminent apostle in the world. That would be like me getting a phone call this morning from Pope Francis. I had revelations about you last night. What does that say about me? I must be like. On God's radar, if the preeminent apostle Peter is receiving revelations about Cornelius, Cornelius, has, he, he's on God's radar. He's been noticed in heaven. And all of this is before Christ. Or is it? Perhaps no one is ever before Christ. Because we are ever before Christ. In other words, you don't have a spiritual journey that predates the cross. Where does your journey begin? Maybe we could even say it began in Adam, but I, I want to say the spiritual journey that leads to the waters of eternal life does not begin the first time you say yes to Jesus. It began the first time Jesus said yes to you in his incarnation. Romans 5 is so important about this these days. When you were weak, he died for you. When you were a sinner, he forgave you. When you were his enemy, Christ reconciled you. And all that has happened to you through the curse of Adam has now been undone through the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Romans chapter 5. That Christ died for the world. 
Before we ever heard of him, even when we were antagonistic towards him, your spiritual journey, when did it begin? 2,000 years ago, through the work of Christ. There's no before Christ, because you were ever before Christ. You, you have always been on his radar. And so I, I think that this is incredible, because from all eternity, you've been carved in the palm of his hands. And it seems to me that Cornelius' story, the validation of his faith practices and his spiritual experiences are rooted in the work of Christ and the incarnation. And Peter comes awake to this. Let's go to the next slide. Peter gives us his eyewitness confirmation that this guy is in and already was. When does he come in? Well, we've got these phrases. Do not deem profane what God has made pure. That's before his baptism. God has made him pure already? Well, it's worse than that. We must not call anyone profane or impure. We must not deem someone an outsider or an outlier. We must, we must begin to see that what Christ did, he did for all, and in some way, in that sense, they're already in. In every people, whoever reveres God and performs works of righteousness is accepted by God. This is, a, this is challenging. Wait a minute. He was already accepted by God? We didn't even get him saved yet. And he's accepted by God. God's seeing his righteousness, hearing his prayers, and he is deemed clean and acceptable already. That brings you to a crisis, I think. Let's go to slide six. What are Peter's takeaways? Peter's takeaways are that there is the therefore. You know, exclusion is over, no one's unclean, God makes no distinction, neither can we. Everyone has been accepted, cleansed, uh, through the work of Jesus Christ, but then what? I love this part. Is Peter's conclusion that the authentic faith practices and spiritual experiences of Cornelius preclude the gospel? Oh, it's okay, he's accepted, Jesus doesn't matter. Is that what Peter thinks? No. What he sees is a man who has come to full term and ready for new birth. And the thing that, that, that occurs to him in the midst of this is, if all of this, let's tell him about Jesus. Let's point to the gospel. It was all for this. this. Let's come to the climax of your spiritual journey with a revelation of Christ in the gospel. And he begins to share the gospel with them. And before, before the, the folks from the outside could even make a response, the Holy Spirit falls on them. And Peter's like, oh no, the Holy Spirit's falling on them. Quick, get some water. He's doing it all backwards. He's already in. And so they, they hurry up and they get some water. And he sees this authentic, acceptable man. And he introduces him to the good news of Jesus Christ. The pregnancy came full term. He's rebirthed. And now let's go to slide number seven. And we read in this gospel that he points to Jesus in his gospel. He says, this one, Jesus, is the Lord of everyone. This one God raised up on the third day. This one God marked out as judge of the living and the dead. To this one all the prophets bear witness. Everyone having faith in him is to receive forgiveness through his name. While still uttering these words, the spirit, the holy one, the gift was poured out on all those who were listening and they were baptized. I just think this is an amazing beautiful kind of radical welcome and inclusion, but it's also an acknowledgement of the whole journey. I got on an airplane, Southwest Airlines, where they give you a number so you can pick your own seat. And so I head down 
uh, down the aisle, and I, I got a really good aisle seat so that my right arm could be the aisle and I could write things and all of that. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. I want space in the seat between me and the window. So I started manspreading so I'd look really unhospitable. I'm like, God, please, just let, let me be left alone. I don't like airplanes, and I, d I really hate evangelists with airplane stories. So... <laughs> But I see this man coming down the aisle, and he catches my eye, and I'm like, oh, no. This is a big guy, you know. I, I have wide shoulders, and he has wide shoulders, and this will not. So I'm looking. I'm not like, look bigger. Inhale, right? And, but no, he, he locks eyes with me, and he comes, and he sits down. And, and, and I notice he's wearing clerical robes. I'm like, oh, I see, I see you're some form of cleric. And he's like, yeah, I am. And, and, and he's, he begins to tell me interesting spiritual journey experience stuff, beginning with this. He tells me, I believe God speaks today. Do you? I'm like, I do. And he said, I believe that God speaks and gives us direction and guidance and counsel. So as I was coming down the aisle, I was asking God, who do you want me to sit with? And he directed me to you. <laughs> Missionaries. But we get into a beautiful conversation about our conceptions of God, and I realize this man is devout. He reveres God. He loves God. And in fact, uh, he listens to God. And when he prays, God hears him and responds. And the things that God has shown him are primarily this. This is his image of God. I, we talked about healthy images of God and toxic images of God, and he says, my image of God is this, that God is merciful, that God is all merciful, that God is especially merciful. Did I mention that he's an imam from Seattle? And we end up having a five-hour flight where we're conversing about our conceptions of God as pure mercy, about the responsibility of preachers to inspire people and lift them up, about our rejection of all violence in the name of God, and the call to be peacemakers one with another. I mean, we're like so on the same page, but of course, the voice in my ear goes, yeah, but he's one of them. And I don't think it was the Lord. It might have been a guilty conscience saying, well, if you're embarrassed of me, I'll be embarrassed of you. When are we going to talk about Jesus? I'm like, I think we'll talk about him now. Because our common ground doesn't preclude the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ. So I said to him, I'm aware of Muslim followers of Jesus who don't convert to Christianity, and yet they're very focused on, on Christ. What do you think of that phenomenon? And he said, oh, I love Jesus. And he said, I know, I know we have some impasses about who Jesus is, but I'm telling you, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is alive. And he's coming again. And he's going to overthrow the Antichrist and establish God's kingdom on earth. I'm like, that's not bad. It's not bad. And we also began to talk about the deal killers. Areas where we're not in agreement about who Jesus is. But what we found out is this. That, that we have immature conceptions of God. And that it, it helps me to think this way. And I shared this with friends this weekend. And they, they thought it was helpful. That as I sit there telling him about who God is. And what has been revealed to me through Jesus. And he's telling me who he thinks God is. And how he loves Jesus. And even though we think differently on it. Maybe we're like two toddlers with crayons. Drawing our picture of God for one another squiggling outside the lines, and I draw my picture of God, and it's really good. I think I've nailed it, actually. And I bring this picture of God to the Father, and I say, God, I've, I, I have this picture of you. Would you take it? And he looks at it, and he smiles, and he hugs me, and he's like, this is fantastic, son. And he puts it on his fridge. <laughs> this will be incredible, because now everybody can look at my picture of God, and they will know exactly what he's like. But Wait. My imam friend is drawing a picture of God, too. Parts of it look the same. All merciful. Especially merciful. The opening lines of the Quran. 
But there's other parts of that. That doesn't look like my picture. Well, at least the father will correct him. And so he, he offers up his picture of God to Allah. And he says, here you go. And, and I'm noticing, like, wait a minute. It's the same dad? The father of Abraham? The, the God of Abraham? The one that Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worship? But, but, but show them that it's wrong. And they, the father takes his picture and he smiles. Why are you smiling? And he embraces him. That's not okay. He puts it on his fridge. Why are you doing that? And the father looks at me. And he says, thank you, Brad. For doing your very best to conceive me through the revelation you've had through Jesus and to, and, and to draw that picture and to share it with the world. That's so great. However, there's a more accurate picture of the image of God that I want you to embrace. And it's in the face of your brother here. And all I ask is you don't poke each other in the eyes with crayons. And that you would show him the radical inclusion and welcome. And you know what? He may never end up seeing Jesus as I do. He may, ne he may revere God and, and, be, and maybe he'll never convert me. I just like don't think I'm going to become a Muslim. What shall we do? How shall well, we will share the good news of Christ. And we will offer the living waters. And all who drink will be saved. I want to just close with some wisdom from my friend Mercy Aiken. I'm like, what does all of this radical cosmic inclusion mean like in light of John 14.6? In John 14.6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God. No one comes to the Father but through me. And what Mercy showed me was that um, how do we preach Christ exclusively and yet inclusively? And it's sort of like this. All through the ages, people have known God through different names. And God welcomed them and embraced them through those names. And they could know God through those names. And uh, what she, she taught me is that at some point, there's this in incredible shift in Judaism where David begins to call God my king, my God, my strong tower, my savior, and it's really accessible and personal. It's not just a generalized God out there up in the sky. He's mine. But then when we come to our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is the spirit of sonship, he begins to, to, to he can validate those other ways of knowing God, but he takes us in way closer. This is my father. And through me, the one unique son who bears the spirit of sonship. If you will come to me, you can know him as father too, and he will become our father. And what, uh, what Mercy is discovering is that when we share that revelation of the unique sonship of Jesus Christ being offered to the world, that Jews, Christians, and Muslims get very, very interested in Jesus because we all want to know God like that. Today, we're going to come to the table. Brian, come on up and rescue the microphone from me. But uh, I'm so excited today to share the body of Christ and the fountain of immortality with my brother. Amen.